honored that you're here tonight. For, seriously, it's been a long few years. And inshallah, whatever you experienced in, in the last three years, you're healing and you're strong for it. And inshallah. I'd like to thank the leadership of the Sundance Institute for their support of our work throughout the years. I know the last year has not been an, an eventful one. And we collectively got through a lot. A special thank you to Joanna Vicente. Please give them a round of applause here. Michelle Satter, Kim Utani, Mary Sadegi, Amber Espinoza Jones, thank you for listening and engaging in very difficult conversations. And thank you to the entire team of the Sundance Film Festival. You're all, you all rise to the occasion this year, and of all the years that MPAC has been at Sundance, and this is our eighth year, this has been the most, it, it, the special, most special. I, I, I don't even know how to express it, so thank you so much. We're having a great time. I'd like to thank the volunteers. Please give them a round of applause. They're, they're the ones making the trains run on time, and they're just, they're just amazing. Um, you know when MPAC, when organizations host events like this, whether it's a panel or a party, um, every organization is assigned a team. And every year we are assigned the solid gold team. And this year has been, there's been no exception. I want to thank the past teams if they're here, but I want to also give a shout out to this year's team. And I'm going to name them by name because they deserve, they, they deserve the recognition for sure. Doug Flint. <laughs> Doug, okay. Mike McCrane, <laughs> Kelly Call, Eliz and Elizabeth Jones. Thank you so much. And thank you to Lux Catering for, for taking care of us and take, you know, for the deli delicious food. So please eat, please do, do, do consume the food because we paid a lot for it. Um, uh, seriously, for, the, um, for, those of you, for those of you who don't know MPAC, we are a public policy advocacy organization. We work at the intersection of public policy and entertainment. And our entertainment industry, our, we began our in entertainment work 30 years ago with the founding of the Media Awards. The MPAC Hollywood Bureau works within the industry to change the narrative around Islam and Muslims. And while we're not a religious organization, we work very hard to protect the image of the faith and its followers by doing three main things. We consult on TV and film projects, we connect our, uh, the Muslim talent to industry decision makers, and we contribute our thought leadership through organizing these panels and discussions. For more information on MPAC, please visit our website, mpachollywoodbureau.org. So whether you are a screenwriter, director, producer, editor, all of the above, or anything else, no matter how hard we work as an advocacy organization, you are doing the heavy lifting. And I, you, are, you are on the front lines. Your stories not only matter, they're vital for future generations. Please don't deprive the world of your stories. Keep pushing, keep shining. On behalf of MPAC and the kid that immigrated to America five decades ago who couldn't see herself on TV, didn't see herself on TV and film, Thank you from the bottom of my, of my heart for doing the heavy lifting. Thank you so much. So please give yourselves, yourselves a round of applause. Thank you. So now I want to ask Rozzy, Evelyn, and um, Omar Nouradine to come on stage for the first panel. So just to, just to couch, just to couch the, the conversation. Um, you know, we have a lot of work ahead of us. Things are feeling good, but there's so much work to do. Uh, you feel the stories that include Muslim characters and storylines are increasing. And this year's ex um, ex uh, festival is actually no exception. Um, every section in the, this year's festival has Muslim artists and or films. And Nida Mansour is here. And Qasim, yeah, oh, did, we, did you want to eat? Is that what it was? Sorry. And, and Qasim is coming later. And there's so many other people who have films here and projects. So congratulations to all of you. Give them a hand. OK, so let me now just shift and uh, turn, the, turn to the panel here. Um, the conversation we're about to have will center around Dr. Evelyn El Sultani's book, Broken, The Failed Promise of Muslim Inclusion. 
and the panelists will question whether or not this expansion of Muslim, Muslim narratives is a result of crisis. And if, they, if not, then how do we keep the movement and the momentum going? Our moderator for this panel is Rossi Jeffrey, who doesn't really need an um, introduction. He's a big part of everyone's lives. Rossi is a talented and thoughtful documentary filmmaker. He's a Sundance Producing Lab Fellow. We met a few, we met a few years ago. We met a few years ago, we met a few years ago when he was working on a short doc called Mil uh, Muslims in the Military, and now it's a feature documentary. So give him a hand. <laughs> Dr. Evelyn El Sultani is a professor at USC, a scholar and an author. Her, bo her, her book will be sold here tonight in the very back. A few years ago, she and I created the Obedi El Sultani test, narrative test, which we'll touch upon, we'll touch upon later in the discussion. And Omar Nuruddin, who is a lawyer, DE and I advisor and MPAC board ex officio. He's one of my dearest friends. He was also the vice president of MPAC. When he told me he was coming to the party, I was like, why waste Omar's, I'm uh, Omar's sighting. And so I asked him to replace me on the panel. And so I'm going to hand it off to you, Rosie, and we are one minute behind schedule. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so th the conversation tonight is centered around um, Evelyn's book. And so as a way of maybe introducing some of the concepts for those of you that are not familiar with the book, uh, I just wanted to maybe have Evelyn kind of give an, a little bit of an overview of the book, um, what brought you to this topic, and uh, maybe just give us some of the main concepts that are covered. Thank you, Razi. It's so great to be here. I want to start by thanking Sue Obeidi for inviting me to be part of this panel. I've had the honor of working with her over the last few years, and I admire her so much and all of her energy. And I also want to thank Omar and Razi for being willing to be in conversation with me tonight. And Dolly's Bookstore is here. They're an independent bookstore in Park City, and they are in the back selling my book. So thank you, Dolly. <laughs> So to begin with what brought me to the book, uh, I was born and raised in New York in the 1970s uh, to an Arab dad, Arab Muslim dad, a uh, Latina Catholic mom, and I grew up with very little representation. I, I grew up watching Raiders of the Lost Ark and um, Jewel of the Nile and these kinds of movies. Ricky Ricardo was the closest thing I had as someone who's also Cuban. It actually meant something to me. Later on, when I learned that Wonder Woman, Linda Carter, was Latina, I couldn't believe it. But I, you know, I grew up with all these stereotypes and watching my family maneuver them on a daily basis. And later, when I went to college, I really wanted to understand my experiences as a Muslim in the United States. And to learn about Islam, you went to Islamic studies, but I wanted to go to ethnic studies. I wanted to learn about the experiences of Muslims racially in the United States. And so after, over the last few years, I've been observing some changes and tracking trends uh, in my research. I study representations of Arabs and Muslims in the media. And uh, I was noticing over the last 10 years or so that Muslims have come to be included in conversations about diversity. For a very long time, we were not included. To be included, we would either talk about racial groups, and Muslims are not a race, so we wouldn't talk about religion when talking about questions of diversity. And uh, so I started trying to figure out what was happening. And so the book is about how Muslims come to be included in diversity politics in the United States. And they have come to be included through a series of crises that have come to be recognized by the public um, as acknowledging that Islamophobia is a problem. So Islamophobia is a very long-standing problem. Some say it started in the seventh century with the beginning of Islam, but we've only started using the term Islamophobia in the early 2010s in the United States. So we've only come to recognize it as a problem recently, and through that recognition, and with Black Lives Matter happening, and the Me Too movement, and other uh, social movements, Islamophobia has also come to be recognized as a problem, and Muslims have started to become included. My main argument, is that Muslims come to be included, and this applies to other groups too, but my book is about Muslims, through what I term crisis diversity. 
crisis diversity is the idea that there's an event that takes place that uh, draws people's attention and galvanizes action. So we can take the Muslim ban as an example. And then corporations issue statements, universities issue diversity, equity, inclusion initiatives to include Muslims. Hollywood starts making representations of Muslims outside of the context of terrorism. And then the crisis moment passes, attention wanes, and we stop paying attention to the issue until the next crisis emerges. So my book is concerned about what kind of outcome do we have with diversity if we are only looking at the crisis moment and not necessarily looking at the root causes. Wonderful, and we'll get in a bit more into it in, in just a moment. And uh, Omar, I wanted to invite you into the conversation as well, and uh, how did you come to this work, the, this DI work that you're doing? Well, is this working yet? Yeah. Well, it started with, with MPAC, actually. So I uh, grew up within the larger MPAC family and the work that it does to kind of create better representations of Muslims, both in media and entertainment, news media and entertainment, and then give Muslims a seat at the table at places of decision, whether it's in Washington, D.C. or at cor you know, in corporate America. So that was my entry point. Now, specifically with entertainment media and the Hollywood Bureau working, for Sue, working with Sue, well, we all work for Sue, right? <laughs> Um, but working with Sue in this work uh, kind of gave me an entry point to what it looks like behind the scenes, right? Like, what are those conversations happening within uh, movie studios, TV networks, and when these crises happen, how they want to respond to them? And currently in my work as a DEI advisor and kind of racial justice, social justice advisor, I work across you know, a lot of different industries, but specifically what you see in the media industry that translate is what I call performative diversity, right? So when you have these moments of crisis diversity, it leads to performative diversity, which is, all right, we have the crisis, how do we make the Muslims happy, right? Or the, you know, Muslims and their allies happy. So let's ask you know, Omar or Evelyn or Razi to, to come and talk about something to our, you know, to our company, to our uh, production company, to our TV network, and have them give a talk so that we can say, look, we're doing something about this issue. But as the crisis, as Evelyn said, passes, they're not invited to come back for a follow-up, right? Lots of great ideas are discussed at these roundtable meetings that happen after a crisis. Um, and then there's no follow-up when, you know, Sue or myself or someone will say, hey, you know, we had talked about five different initiatives at this roundtable about how to create better representations of Muslims in media. And then you send the follow-up emails. We actually want to start getting to work on it. Your emails don't get answered, right? So that's what I think is this parallel between the crisis and then is the work that's being done actually meant to create systemic change or is it just to appease you know, the folks that have enough voice now to actually matter. Because right before, there were crises that happened before, but it wasn't, you know, the Muslim contingency within entertainment media wasn't large enough where anyone cared. Now they care, but the question is, how do you start creating that systemic change? So I want to <clears throat> stay on this just a little bit longer. Um, uh, you guys started getting into how diversity is done and how diversity training is done. What are the benefits and harms to Muslims specifically in this form of diversity training that we're seeing today? So I would say the benefits are that we want to be seen, we want to be included, and it feels good to have recognition. I want the recognition. An Islamophobic event happens, I want the recognition. Uh, the problem comes, in, in my perspective, when we are only focused on the crisis. So let me think about an example. Let's take Muslim ban. Um, because Muslim ban led to unprecedented action. As Omar said, there have been countless crises. It's not as if Muslim ban was the first crisis that Muslim people were facing, but it was the first crisis that led to this unprecedented galvanizing action. Sue and I have had a lot of conversations that we believe it is a Trump effect, that he was, um, he inspired action. He inspired mobilization because he was so overt with his racism that what happened with Trump was not possible under Obama because people were basically sleeping at the wheel that we had a black president and thinking things were so great. So we have all these changes in Hollywood. I actually have um, a list of shows that I've noticed have changed. And I think I saw Fauzia Mirza here and I know she wrote a character for the red line. Um, and that's one example that we start seeing Muslim characters and contexts having nothing to do with terrorism. Nita Mansour is here 
and she wrote We Are Lady Parts, an incredible, incredible uh, TV show that I love more than anything. But we have Rami, we have Mo, Ms. Marvel, Lady Parts, sort of, Transplant, FBI, DC Legends of Tomorrow, Grey's Anatomy uh, threw in Dr. Kadri, uh, Tan France on Queer Eye, we have the bull type, we have all these Muslim characters that didn't exist before and shows that actually focus on Muslim characters. Uh, LL Cool J came out as Muslim on NCIS. On Love Victor, he has a friend Rahim, who's an Iranian Muslim. 911 Lone Star, uh, Alison Abdullah on Orange is the New Black. Uh, so there are just so many, and there are others. This is just my short list so that I wouldn't forget. Uh, so lots of change, uh, and it's remarkable, and I wish I grew up like that, but I don't know if it's going to continue. The other day I watched um, Jack Ryan season three, and in the first season uh, there is an FBI character played by Wendell Pierce. Uh, he's Muslim, and there's a terrorist Muslim, so we have this patriotic Muslim in there seemingly to balance the stereotype. And by season three, his Muslim identity is meaningless, it's not even mentioned. But they did the work in season one, but by season three it doesn't matter because there's no Muslim ban right now. So I'm concerned about how it drops out of the conversation and it, we don't really focus on the root causes. My um, other point here is that for Hollywood to make such changes, the real crisis in Hollywood is an entire history of misrepresenting and stereotyping many different groups. That is the crisis repairing a history of harmful representations. The Muslim ban for Hollywood, is that the crisis? The Muslim ban exposes Islamophobia, but Islamophobia is still here, whether we have the Muslim ban or not. So if I were speaking to Hollywood, I would say that the crisis needs to be looking at all of the communities that have been marginalized over 100 years of filmmaking, and what does it mean to repair that history rather than responding to specific crises and producing a few shows that, yes, feel good and are meaningful and they mean a lot to me, but in terms of long-term change, more, more is needed. Yeah, and, and we'll get to kind of, you know, looking ahead, uh, what some uh, meaningful changes might be. But Omar, I also wanted to invite you to expand on that of what are some of the benefits and harms of the way that um, diversity training and these DEI programs are done uh, today. Yeah, I think um, the benefits, I think Evelyn talked about, uh, I, I don't have much more to add there. I mean, the other benefit is that a community as diverse and large as the Muslim community doesn't have one story, right? There are so many different stories that can come out of Muslim communities, intersectional stories, right? Some of the characters you talked about in those shows, there are queer Muslims, there are Latino Muslims, there are, you know, Muslims at all sorts, doctors, but also playing, uh, you know, different types of professions. So the more stories that are told, I think that's the better. So that's one of the benefits of looking at the diversity within the Muslim community as well. I think one of the harms or kind of pitfalls is that, and this is kind of goes to the diversity industry altogether, is that it can create its own stereotyping effects. And what I mean by that is there is a certain type of Muslim character that could be overly represented. And one of the examples that we've seen, and we're starting to see a shift from this, is the good Muslim and then the bad Muslim. So there's a number of shows, you know, we're talking about through the uh, late 2010s to, you know, now in the 2020s, of if we're gonna have a Muslim terrorist, then we need the patriotic Muslim, you know, FBI agent or counterterrorism person or the reformed terrorist where, then that story gets being uh, replayed and creates its own type of negative stereotyping effect. The other is that kind of looking, not in the kind of substantive creative content, but in the decision making, is saying, okay, well now we know that the Muslim community in the entertainment industry has a critical mass where we need to pay attention to them, so we're gonna add them to the box of like checklists that we have to check off. So we've got for our film festival, the, you know, two Muslim mm -hmm. films that are going to check off that box, and there may be five Muslim films that would otherwise qualify based on their storytelling, their writing, their cinematography that should be included, but people start to get, you know, the decision makers get into this narrow mindset of we have to have some, and then everyone else, you know, we're not going to really pay attention to them because we've got our, 
or two that can satisfy the critical mass. So you start to lose some of the uh, looking independently at the merit of what the projects are, and they just become you know, some form of checkbox. Yeah, one of the things that you guys are um, alluding to is this sort of quota system almost of checking things off the list. And um, one of the things that um, I'm sort of starting to sense is a type of uh, insecurity amongst white institutions and, and, and structures, uh, feeling like if, you know, maybe people are being replaced, um, if there's too much inclusion. And so we have to sort of keep these kind of quotas. I'm curious what your reflections on that might be of just these institutions, which the majority of them are still white spaces and uh, spaces that many of us don't feel very welcome in, sometimes still to this day. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that of just like this fear and anxiety that um, these larger communities might have if you have too many, if you break that quota of like, oh, we have too many, too many Muslim stories and what are we going to do? You know, I'm curious if you have any thoughts on that. I mean, I, I definitely think that there is this backlash against diversity right now. We are seeing that in Florida in terms of what's being taught, mm, and it's yeah. a threat uh, to those who want white people to remain in the same position of power that they've been in for over 400 years. So we are seeing a lot of, while there is a lot of diversity work, there's also a backlash to that diversity work that comes with the territory. Mm. And I think that backlash has a lot to do with trying to hold on to power and not wanting, um, you know, the whole make America great again sentiment, yeah. wanting to maintain that. Yeah, there, you know, there's actually some uh, social psychology research on this backlash. And some of the language that diversity programs have adopted uh, create this backlash, is spe specifically in um, uh, kind of white dominated institutions and places. And that's using diverse or diversity as a code word for everything that's non-white. And so when we say, hey, we're looking, we need a diverse filmmaker, a diverse filmmaker, one, diver uh, one filmmaker is diverse. That even just semantically, that's the wrong usage of the word. Diversity is about groups uh, and collections, not individuals. And when you use that sort of language in pushing out diversity initiatives, it creates in the mindset of many white people a feeling that I lack that, I lack diversity, rather than looking at diversity about a collection or a group of people. And so even some of the like language that's used, and that takes us back to our uh, kind of different types of equality models that are operating in American society. One of them is the colorblindness equality model, which race is not an issue. I don't see race, I just see people, I don't see gender. Um, but when you're using the word like a diverse candidate, what do you actually mean? Do you mean we don't have enough black filmmakers, you know, in our slate of films, or queer filmmakers, or you know, you know, women? So using diverse as code for everything that is not part of you know white male dominant culture um, creates that sort of backlash, rather than being more specific about why you know we need more black filmmakers in our slate. Yeah, wonderful. I, I wanted to actually bring in another um, concept um, in your book. Um, it's introduced in the early chapters, but it's this, what I guess I would sort of describe as the economics of diversity um, through the lens of uh, neoliberal and liberal multiculturalism. Um, and you used a really great example of the, of the Supreme Court, University of Michigan affirmative action case. And so um, I was wondering if you could sort of introduce this topic and the role of economics and capitalism in this space and kind of help set the tone for you know, that part of the conversation a bit. Razzie's getting real academic up here. <laughs> um, so regarding the affirmative action case, I think it connects to what Omar was saying. Um, there was a case where a white woman sued the University of Michigan in 2003 uh, because she was not admitted into the law school. And she said she had a stellar GPA and that she was a victim of reverse racism. And as a result of this case, the University of Michigan, the case went to the Supreme Court and they argued that uh, rather than saying we need diversity to challenge uh, a history of inequality and we're going to use diversity to give uh, minoritized, marginalized populations opportunities, instead they said diversity benefits everyone. Diversity leads to a better educational environment. 
everyone gets to learn and everyone benefits. And this is an important moment where there's a shift in how diversity is conceptualized from, and it emerged to replace affirmative action because affirmative action was trying to very directly uh, find a way to uh, repair a history of inequality. A lot of people criticize affirmative action. It's on the decline. And so diversity is on, on going up to replace affirmative action. But this shift basically meant that diversity was no longer necessarily about repairing um, a history of inequality, but rather it was about it being good for everyone. So the new model is, and sure, it's good for everyone, but the next step is it's good for business. And there have been lots of studies that say it's profitable. You should do it because you'll make money. You should do it because your teams are better and more innovative when you have diverse uh, groups. All of that is true and great, but then what happens to the project of rectifying 400 years of injustice? Are we still doing that? Is diversity still allowing us to actually create a more equitable society or not? So in terms of um, neoliberalism, which in my book I'm looking at how corporations and other institutions have come to play a leading role in diversity, stating that diversity is a key value, and they're basically social influencers around diversity. But what happens, for example, when Hollywood is trying to think about diversity alongside profit, is that we get um, what I call the diversity compromise. So after uh, the Muslim ban, uh, Sue and I actually were having a lot of conversations where we said, hey, did you see uh, Lone Star 911? That's amazing, they have a firefighter. She wears a hijab, she's an amazing character. But yeah, there was that episode, her hijab fell off and her hair was blowing in the wind. What are they doing? And there was case after case, oh, you know, did you see Aladdin? Wow, the casting is so much better. They didn't whitewash like they always do. They actually have a cast of Iranian and South Asian and Arab actors, this is amazing. But yeah, it's totally Orientalist. So it ends up being like, okay, we're gonna make this small change, but we are not gonna repair the entire thing. Orientalism, portraying the East as exotic, it still sells, it's still profitable, so we're gonna keep that, but we're gonna have uh, better casting practices. And so it feels like this compromise, like you're one step better, but you're not there yet. And the same thing with the, uh, there have been, we, we had many, many shows that we were talking about, and that's what led us to create the Obedi al Sultani test. There are postcards actually on all of the tables, uh, Sue and I created the Obedi al-Sultani test to help Hollywood improve representations of Muslims. We were inspired by other tests, um, the DuVernay test for racial representation, uh, the Bechtel test for gender representation, the Russo test for LGBTQ representation. There's also a RIS test for Muslim representation out of the UK that highlights um, all the stereotypes around terrorism and oppressed veiled women. But our test is specifically we see you trying Hollywood, but oftentimes the efforts are falling short and we want to try to help you get there. And a lot of those efforts falling short have to do with believing that the audience still wants a particular kind of stereotype and then making a slight tweak to make things better and it just doesn't take us all the way. Um, and I'm actually looking out into the audience as people looking at the postcards of these Obedi al Sultani tests. So um, maybe you can, do you mind just walking us through some of the nuts and bolts and perhaps how a layperson could sort of use it as a filter and apply it um, to things that they're consuming? Sure. So it has uh, five uh, criteria. Uh, the first is that the project that includes a Muslim character does not reproduce old tropes, but explores new stories. The idea here is. Do we need an, another Orientalist story? Do we need a remake of Aladdin? Do we need a remake of Sinbad? Do we need to remake all of these Orientalist stories? Uh, similarly, there have been quote unquote innovative approaches to terrorism. Jack Ryan, season one is one example where you get this rich backstory for the terrorist. He's not motivated by his religion or culture, but rather uh, the US sent drone strikes and killed his family. And then he moved to France and he couldn't find a job because of racism and all of these things happen that lead to him becoming a terrorist. So the idea here is we don't need the same old stories remade. Why not explore the incredible talent in this room and create some new stories? Uh, the second is that the project that includes Muslim characters has a Muslim identifying writer or staff. 
from beginning to end. So rather than calling me in as a consultant at the very end where you can't even change anything anyway, why don't you have someone who is a writer, one, maybe more than one, in the room if you are producing something about a particular community, have those community members, those creatives on your team from the beginning to the end to avoid um, all kinds of mistakes. The third is the Muslim character is not solely defined by their religion. So in this moment of improvements, uh, there have been characters. Um, one that stuck out to me was Netflix's Messiah, where all of the uh, Muslim characters were either hyper-religious or hyper-political, and all of the other characters had complex backstories and were really interesting. So there seems to be a lack of imagination around Muslims that we're not just people, but we're really, really political and we're really, really religious. So the idea here is, you know, religion is part of your identity. It doesn't have to define every single thing like you're a robot. Uh, the fourth is uh, the Muslim character has a strong presence in the storyline. Of course, not every storyline has to have a Muslim lead, but we noticed Grey's Anatomy is an example. Dr. Qadri was thrown in the background. She was wonderful. But when she was uh, booted off the show, it didn't matter. It was irrelevant to the storyline. So to think in terms of diversity, it's a very easy thing to do, to just throw people in the background. And so this is to ask, please think more carefully about how you are including people in your stories. And the fifth is that the Muslim character is portrayed with diverse backgrounds and identities. For a very long time, Arab and Muslim identities have been co-produced, and we've seen mainly Arab characters, most of them as terrorists. Uh, so the idea here is to expand who Muslims are. We are seeing more black Muslims portrayed. We are seeing more queer Muslims portrayed. I've never seen an Indonesian Muslim on TV. I don't know if you have, and there are 200 million Muslims in Indonesia. Uh, so our vision of who Muslims are is, is very narrow, and so we are encouraging expanding uh, who Muslims are. Yeah, I, I was just going to invite you into the conversation to basically, you know, I'm wondering what you... Uh, what are the what are the what is the potential of this test and this filter if we apply it to its full potential? Well, I think the test is an, a great example of how you move beyond performative diversity or the kind of uh, utilitarian diversity that you talked about as um, happening after the the Supreme Court case and the university, which I teach in my constitutional law class at USC. So uh, it's it's how you move into talking about systemic change, right? So the test talks about not only what you 